Our company manual contains our FAA Operations Specifications, or OPSPECs for short. They are divided into five standard parts, A through E, General, En Route, Terminal, Maintenance, and Weight and Balance authorizations. These are essentially custom-tailored Federal Aviation regulations that apply specifically and exclusively to one operator. They take precedence over the generic Part 135 and Part 91 regs. Sometimes they are more restrictive, and often they are actually less restrictive, as we are about to see in just a moment. But in all cases, we must abide by them when operating under Part 135. Conversely, when operating under Part 91, we must abide by the Part 91 regs. This is C-55 from our own company, OpSpecs. It's commonly referred to as the one-nav, two-nav rule. C-55 takes precedence over 135-221. And that's a good thing, because if we went strictly by 135-221, we'd be stuck with either the standard alternate mins of 602-802, or the published non-standard alternate mins for that airport or approach. Instead, C-55 says, quote, the certificate holder is authorized to derive alternate airport weather minimums from the alternate airport IFR weather mins table listed below. It then goes on to say that, quote, in no case shall the certificate holder use an alternate airport weather minimum other than any applicable minimum derived from this table. This is important. It means when we operate under Part 135, we always, always, always derive our own alternate mins. That's 100% of the time, 10 occasions out of 10. Unfortunately, we only get this special privilege on Part 135 legs. We are not allowed to do it when we operate under Part 91. The op specs only govern 135 operations. We are allowed to use the one nav rule anytime we have at least one available and authorized standard instrument approach procedure. We are only allowed to use the two nav rule, however, if we meet two key criteria. Criterion number one, we must have at least two approaches involving separate nav aids going to different suitable runways. Criterion number two, you are only allowed to use straight in mins, not circling mins. Separate nav aids simply means that we are talking about two independent physical ground-based facilities. For example, a VOR that's located over here and an NDB that's located over there. If lightning hits the VOR, it doesn't necessarily have any effect at all on the NDB. So those would be considered separate. A localizer approach to 7, on the other hand, and a localizer back course approach to the reciprocal runway 25 would not count as separate nav aids because they both use the same physical ground-based facility, in this case the localizer antenna. So, if a Lear lost its hydraulic system and therefore its brakes and came in high and fast and ran off the end of the runway and into the lake, knocking down the localizer array in the process, that would take out both the localizer and the localizer back course approaches. Different runways means runways that go in different directions. It can be the same actual strip of pavement, but you need two different numbers. Runways 9 or left and 9 or right are not considered different runways because if the wind precludes landing on 9 or left, it also precludes landing on 9 or right. 7 and 25, however, do count as different runways. They do not count as separate runways, though. And notice that C55 does go on to specifically say that for extended range operations, aka ER ops, you actually do need separate runways, not just different runways. Since my company doesn't do any ER ops, all we need is different runways, not separate runways. For the one nav rule, add 401 to the approach mins. For the two nav rule, add 200 feet to the higher height above touchdown of the two approaches you're using. Add one half statute mile visibility to the higher minimum landing visibility of the two approaches you're using.
600 and one and a half. Therefore, I need at least a 600 foot ceiling and at least one and a half statute miles visibility forecast to exist at my ETA, at my alternate, in order for me to be able to legally file it, designate it as my alternate. Now, let's consider an airport with three non-precision approaches. All right, now we have the option of either using the one nav rule or the two nav rule. The only way to know for sure is to try them both and see which one gives you better, more advantageous alternate mins. With experience, you'll be able to tell just by looking, but in this case, let's begin by verifying that we actually can use the two nav rule. Do we have separate nav aids going to different runways? Yes, so check. And do we have straight in mins, no circling? Check. Okay, so we know we can use the two nav rule. So what we're going to do is we're going to pick two approaches. Logically, we're going to pick the two lowest, which would be the localizer and the VOR. So we're going to pick these mins right here. And we're not even going to consider the NDB in this planning process. Now, in accordance with the 2 nav rule, we are going to take the higher height above touchdown, which is 841, which we round up to 900, and we add 200 to that. So we need an 1100 foot ceiling. Then we're going to take the higher minimum landing visibility, miles. We're going to add half a mile to that. Therefore, we need an 1,100 foot ceiling and two and a half statute miles visibility forecast to exist at our ETA, at our intended alternate, in order to be able to legally file this airport as our IFR alternate under Part 135. One point of special importance to those pilots who often jump back and forth between Part 91 and Part 135 legs is that although 91-169 does say that in lieu of having the required alternate mins, the weather may allow for a descent and landing under VFR, 135-221 omits this language and does not allow for VFR as an alternative to having the 135 alternate mins.